Uh, like with you folks, this is a new experience, taping this about a month and a half before we actually show it. And uh, anyways, for those who've been to previous beef bashes down at Princeton, you've heard me talk about every two years. And I want to give you an update on the work we've been doing with um, sup selenium supplementation forms to help ameliorate our other big problem in the state, which is vescutoxicosis. So our project objectives is to determine how the biological systems are altered by fescutoxicosis. In the past, you've heard me talk about how our big marker for fescutoxicosis is prolactin, reduced serum prolactin, reduced serum alkaline phosphatase, and of course, ultimately ending up in reduced weight gain on uh, growing steers. So in this model, we've been trying to understand some of the other biological systems that are at play. And for this particular study, we have a, what we call a red herd, which is inorganic selenium, a blue herd of cattle, which are only fed organic selenium, and then a green herd, which is sort of unique to what we're doing here at U UK, where we're doing a 50-50 mix of inorganic, so sodium selenite, organic, in our case, cellplex, and then a 50-50 mix of that. As you know from previous talks, we've seen some differences in controlled studies. So this trial was set up to allow us to look at what happens to calves taken from each of these three herds, so therefore that have were conceived and grew up on inorganic versus organic versus the mix, and see how they respond to a common challenge of grazing an endophyte infected tall pass fescue pasture. So those fields right out here, for those of you familiar with that. So when we do this, we need to really think about what's going on in the biochemistry of the animal. And this complicated chart is showing that. But this is how we understand selenium metabolism in cattle. What we have in the inorganic, in red here, when that is consumed by the cow, it is then taken and has a separate pathway over here into inorganic forms and excreted separately in urine in two different forms. That's compared to when we feed organic bound selenium, we have the blue pathway over here. This is what we call the non-regulated and then the regulated pathway. So when we feed a mix, we are feeding a combination of the red and the blue gives us our green. And as you can see from this metabolism, with the blue, this um, selenium that's absorbed goes into selenium met and it is continually cycled for a period of time. This is why when you feed an organic bound selenium, the selenium levels in the blood are higher because it continues, the selenium met is continually cycled in the body. When we feed the red and the blue together, i.e. our green form, what we're doing biochemically is feeding in and driving both of these systems at the same time. One of the things I've shared with you in previous talks is that this combination of the red and the blue with our green mix gives us a much different profile, genomic expression profile in testes, liver, and as I'll show you today, the pituitary. So in the, our trial then, we are looking at calves, how do they perform on tall fescue, raised from red, the inorganic, so driving this pathway, versus the blue, driving this pathway, versus calves that have developed on the green, where both of them are happening. And we're asking, does this preparation help one or all th any of these do better on the endophyte infected tall pasture? Or pasture or fescue. So if we're feeding different forms of selenium, what we'd expect to see, as shown here, is the red blood selenium levels are lower than the blue. That's what most of the literature shows. And then our green, which is half red and half blue, gives us the same levels as all blue. What this is showing us then is that as expected, the red, the forms, the blue form and the green form, 
which both have organic selenium in it, have a higher circulating level of selenium than you have with the red. This is what we would expect and we've seen before from our pathways. So the question is, does it help prolactin, so serum prolactin, which is a hallmark of fescue toxicosis? And as you can see, again, the red line is a decreasing amount of prolactin for the red herd calves versus the green and blue herd, which have higher levels of prolactin. And over this period, this mounts about a 40 to 50 percent increased prolactin or an amelioration of the fescue-induced decrease in prolactin in these steers grazing the endophyte infected tall fescue. So one of the next things we want to look is why is this happening mechanistically? We need to understand how that is happening. To understand prolactin, you need to think about the pituitary. And more specifically, this lower part in pink, the anterior pituitary. And this is the gland that controls a lot of the metabolism in the whole body. For example, or specifically, there's a group of cells called lactotrophs. And lactotrophs are the ones responsible for prolactin synthesis. When we did a series of genomic expression studies and then followed up with targeted RT-PCR studies, we found that the increased prolactin induced by the green and the blue treatments were for different, perp different reasons. The green uh, treatment is upregulating one of the receptors and then increases messenger RNA expression, as does the blue, but then the green also increases the made prolactin, its ability to be secreted into the blood. In contrast, the blue uh, treatment, the organic only treatment, was responsible for increasing uh, messenger RNA levels, acting as more prolactin being transcribed and made into the protein. So, with this as a mechanism, it allows us to understand what's going on with the lactotrophs and explains prolactin. Because this was a genomic study, we also determined another set of pituitary um, hormones being released, and this is something called a POMC product, and that ended up being spliced or cut out to ACTH. And ACTH, as we know, is responsible for adrenal gland function. So one of the things we were going to be looking at in our next study is the pituitary with the altered ACTH, what effect does that have on adrenal glands? Adrenal glands have three main hormones that we look at. One is cortisol. Cortisol is going to trigger metabolic changes in the liver. And so we went ahead with the same the liver from the same steers as the pituitary and that were grazing the pasture, and we conducted a genomic analysis. And you can see here with this pattern, this graph we call a heat map, that the blue steers are responding gene pattern like that. The green steers are here, and response the liver, the red steers are here. The big point here is you can see there's patterns. This cluster is red versus green versus red. So we have the difference in treatments. And all these clusters, these all represent different genes. And so from this, we can tell which genes change. So from this analysis, we looked more closely at the liver for genes responsible for the metabolism. Most specifically, from a group of cells we call the paracentral cells, hepatocytes, versus a group of hepatocytes called the paraportal. These cells, are responsible for paraportal for producing urea, whereas the paracentral, close to the central vein, they're responsible for producing glutamine. So the commonality between ure urea and glutamine is ammonia, the nitrogen. And so what we found is that the green steers, represented by this pattern of changing genes, actually has decreased urea synthesis and increase glutamine synthesis. So this means that the green steers are more efficient at recycling the nitrogen and then the blue or the red steers. So this is a positive for growth. So from all of this study, 
the question to the producer is, did I get more calf growth at the end of the summer? And the answer is, quantitatively you did, with green and blue being higher than red, but not statistically. So when we do a power analysis, which is a test, a statistical test we use to say, if this same variation that we measured in eight steers of treatment, how many occurred if we do more steers, how many more steers we have to have? And the answer for that is 40. So our next set of trials will be looking at this similar structured experiment, only where we have 40 red, 40 green, and 40 blue, and see if these changes really occur. The other thing we're going to be doing in the steers we take pituitary is take the adrenal glands and do the metabolic and genomic analysis in those to look at cortisol. Does cortisol synthesis up or down affected by red, blue, or green treatment? What about the catecholamines? The catecholamines, importantly, are dopamine, which is interacting with the ergot alkaloids in, in fescue infect, endophyte infected tall fescue, as well as epinephrine and norepinephrine. And if you remember your high school physiology, these are, are the ones that are going to increase your immediate stress, whereas cortisol is more chronic stress. So, and fescue toxicosis at the cellular level really induces a lot of stress. And so we're interested in looking at how that was affect. And more specifically, epinephrine and norepinephrine definitely affect whether your vasculature is restricted or functionally normally. What's a hallmark of fescue toxicosis? The cows standing in the ponds because their peripheral vasculature or peripheral circulation has been reduced. They're hot. That's why they're standing in the ponds to cool off. The same thing, the catecholamines, as well as the third hormone we're interested in produced by the adrenal glands, controlled by pituitary secretions, is what's going on in the kidney because this aldosterone controls mineral metabolism in the kidney or the recovery. And this greatly affects vasculature volume. If it affects the volume, so kidney function is definitely involved in the fescue toxicosis response. So that's kind of where we're at, where we have an overall hypothesis now that overall the green or the mix, the 50-50 mix, has a number of beneficial results in terms of metabolites, in terms of genomic and targeted gene expression in the pituitary and the liver, and with our next studies, going to be see, follow that all the way down in the adrenal glands, the kidney, and the vasculature. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions.